Hello, this is Tim Congdon, uh, Chair of the Institute for International Monetary Research at the University of Buckingham. I'm going to be talking in this video about recent developments in monetary policy uh, as they affect inflation and other things. It's an interesting time. Uh, it's uh, late July 2022. Just had the warmest day on record in, in England. Uh, and uh, there's been a little bit of heat in the debate on monetary policy as well. Now I should warn here at the start that this presentation will be to use a word favoured by Paul Krugman, it will be wonkish. It'll be the kind of um, discussion that policy wonk wonks get into. And by that, Krugman always means, in his column in the New York Times, it is going to be rather difficult and technical. Well, I'm afraid this presentation will be difficult and technical, although of very direct relevance to what's going on in money, banking, monetary policy, and so on. In fact, it's going to be ultra um, wonkish because I'm going to be having some econometric results cited at you. I'll explain what it's all about as we go through the presentation. Now, as you'll know, the inflation rate at the moment in all of the main countries apart from Japan and apart also from Switzerland, inflation has risen sharply in the last year, 18 months. And um, policy is now changing radically uh, and um, the rate of money growth was extremely high in 2020 is now slowing down. Hugh Pill, uh, the distinguished economist, was appointed chief economist of the Bank of England in September last year. And he's just given a speech under the title, uh, um, What Have the Monetarists Ever Done for Us? Well, I suppose I'm regarded as a monetarist, which is fair enough. Um, and um, I didn't like Mr. Pill's speech. It was not very enthusiastic about monetarism. Sure, there was a little bit of praise. Uh, Mr. Pill, in fact, damned with faint praise. That was what he was trying to do. And he referred, in fact, to the Institute. And I want to respond to what he said. Now, one of the things that's happened in the UK in recent months is the rate of growth of money has fallen to about 5% at an annualised rate, annualised the last three to six months. And that is the bulk of the adjustment necessary to get inflation back down to low single digits. Interest rates matter a bit, but it's the movement in money growth that is really critical as far as I'm concerned. And uh, there was something that the Institute said in a note that I didn't write, uh, uh, and Mr. Pill refers to the Institute as saying that um, you know, we are not at the moment uh, arguing for a large increase in interest rates. For us, what really matters is the rate of growth of the quantity of money, which has indeed slowed down. I haven't actually written said an awful lot about the UK. I've said a lot more about the United States. And there, the slowdown in money growth in 2022 has been dramatic. The principal kind of money in a modern economy, bank deposits. And this shows you the growth rate in the last three months of bank deposits annualized. Uh, it shows you we have in, say, uh, 13 weeks, an increase of 2% in bank deposits that annualize around 8%. Sometimes you get increases in 13 weeks of only of about 10% that annualizes kind of 45%. And sometimes bank deposits fall. Now you can see from this chart that um, it goes back to 2016. This is relates to the United States. You can see that uh, there was that extraordinary leap upwards in 2020. That's what caused me to warn about rapid inflation in the USA. Came down, 
moved back up again towards 20%. And now look at it. It is indeed, in the last three months, falling. So you've got, uh, in the United States, you've got a combination of falling bank deposits, static, perhaps even falling money overall. Bank deposits aren't all of money. And you've also got inflation heading up towards double digits. So you've got the quantity of real money balances contracting, getting on for double digit annual rates. This is extremely restrictive monetary policy. Uh, on all of the theories that I regard as effective and useful, it will mean inflation does come back under control in the United States after a recession. The movement at fund, Fed funds rate is not really the point. It's this change in monetary growth that really matters. Now, I have a lot of trouble with these ideas with um, academic economists, including some very distinguished academic economists. And here we have a chap called Ken Rogoff, professor at Harvard, um, who in spring, May, spring, in spring, summer of 2020, was talking about the need for negative Fed funds rate of minus 5% to deal with looming disinflation, as he saw it rising from COVID. And now is in favor of 5% positive Fed funds rate to deal with the inflation problem. These violent movements of, of interest rates he thinks necessary to deal with whatever ha whatever's happening at the moment. I don't like this kind of thing. And the trouble arises from a kind of macroeconomics that Rogoff and many others believe in. They think that interest rates are crucial to macroeconomic policy making and to the behavior of the economy. It's not true. If we compare the effectiveness of money and interest rates in motivating spending and output, money is much, much more important. Anybody who's worked with data going back many decades, worked with that data carefully over a long period of time, knows that money is far more important than interest rates. This is something said by Anna Schwartz, one of the uh, collaborators of Milton Friedman. They were long time collaborators in, in their monetary research. She, she said this back in 1969. Uh, and uh, let me just quote from, from what she said. She said, <clears throat> The correlations between the level of, of or level or rates of change in interest rates on the one hand and the rates of change in nominal income prices and output on the other are considerably worse, considerably worse than those between the rates of change in the quantity of money and these magnitudes. Where does Mr. Pill at the Bank of England stand on these questions? Well, in that speech he gave on the 24th of June, where he referred to the Institute, he made pretty clear where he stands. And uh, let me again quote what he said. He said, <clears throat> he referred to some work by a chap called Poole, an American economist. Um, his Poole's work on effects of changes and the shifts of money demand have long been embedded in central bank practice with short-term interest rates being the operational instrument of monetary policy. And this centrality of short-term interest rates is now also central to the canonical, canonical model of monetary policy outlined in Michael Woodford's book, Interest and Prices. And this book both captures and has catalyzed the large and still growing literature on interest rate rules for monetary policy. So on the face of it, Mr. Pill goes along with Professor Rogoff and many others in this area, as far as he's concerned, it's interest rates that really matter to monetary policy and the evolution of the economy. Now, let me make clear that I'm very much on Anna Schwartz's side, the monetarist side in this exchange, this view, this, and I, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to look at evidence. I've done a bit of this for the United States, where I published an article last year, it's something called the Journal of Economic Affairs. It's a review of a book by a chap called Ed Nelson, who worked at the Federal Reserve 
it was writing about Milton Friedman's work. I there, I there quoted uh, Anna Schwartz's 1969 statement, and I then carried out some statistical work myself, seeing what had happened in the 50 years from 1969 to 2019, and again, I got the same result as Anna Schwartz. The relationship between money and income is imperfect. The relationship between money and interest rates doesn't exist, it's just dreadful. And what I want to do now is to do the same thing for the United Kingdom, because obviously Mr. Pill is chief economist at the Bank of England that's responsible for monetary policy in the United Kingdom. Let's look here at a chart of the rates of change of real private demand, the dominant kind of aggregate demand, uh, relative to changes in real broad money. I've cut out government spending because government spending isn't affected by money. The government doesn't have to worry about the size of its bank balance uh, because it can always borrow from the Bank of England, to put it crudely. The relationship is not perfect. Again, as the United States, there's lots of trouble every now and again. But there is a relationship. Uh, and um, as I say, we can do some econometrics, and I'll do that shortly. What then about real private demand and interest rates? You know, the way that Mr. Pill and Professor Rogoff and many others think is that when interest rates go down, that stimulates demand, causes changes in the rate of growth of nominal GDP, and so following Michael Woodford's supposedly brilliant book, we don't need to look at quantities of money because there's this direct, reliable relationship between interest rates and demand. <clears throat> well, here are the data. This is the, again, the growth of a real private demand. Uh, and then we've got the uh, level of interest rates. You'll see, the 19, mid-1970s, that um, you have very low real interest rates and actually a recession. That was 1974-75. And as I was a young man then, and um, I looked very much was aware of this experience, and this is one of the things that made me believe that it's money that matters, not interest rates. We need to remember, however, that the, we need to, it's the inverse of the interest rate that, that matters to demand, because it, it's, if interest rates go down, that boosts demand. That's the idea. That's, what, that's the way that Pill and uh, uh, Woodford and Rogoff think. So here we have a chart of uh, um, inverted um, real interest rates against real private demand, 1964 to 2019, the same period as for the money chart. Can you find a relationship? Can you see one? Well, if you can, you're darn sight better than me because I can't see one. You can see in 1974-75, uh, uh, um, the uh, um, very low real interest rates, which should be boosting demand. No, we have the recession. And then through the 1980s, we have very high real interest rates, which should be dampening down the economy. No, the economy is go going fine. There's no relationship here, and I'll soon produce an econometric result that demonstrates that. Let's just remind ourselves again of what Mr. Pill said. He said that, you know, it, it's short to interest rates that the operational instrument of monetary policy. Look, I don't dispute that interest rates are part of monetary policy, and I, I myself believe that if there's excessive growth of money, interest rates should be raised. If money growth is too low, they should be reduced. But I would always, always look at the behavior of money, unlike Mr. Pill, unlike Professor Rogoff, unlike Professor Woodford. And I've shown you why. Now, I said I was going to be ultra wonkish. Here are the econometric result results. The, I've regressed, uh, um, I've progressed the change in real private demand on real broad money and real interest rates. 
the coefficient. It's the right sign for money, about half. It's not brilliant. It could be higher, could, but it's all right. The t-statistic, which measures the significance of the coefficient, is fine. It has a value of 10. The equation doesn't explain an awful lot of the movement in real private demand, but it is relevant. If we brought in, say, the change in world trade, we get an equation with 0 0.6, 0 0.7 kind of correlation coefficient. But then look, please look at what happens to those things when we look at the money against interest rates. It's not clear the coefficient is different from zero. Um, it's not, it, it's not statistically significant. The value of t statistic is under two. It's useless. I'm sorry this has been a rather, as I say, wonkish uh, video presentation. My point here is relatively simple, that the behavior of money is fundamental to the development of nominal national income, nominal money against nominal national income, real money against real national income, must always be watched by central banks. The central mistake that was made by the Bank of England and other central banks in 2020 was to ignore the effect of the big asset purchases that they were carrying out on the quantity of money. Can I, before I close on all this, just say that um, I've been in this situation one or two times before. In the mid-1980s, the Bank of England, pushed on really by the Treasury, that they stopped what was called overfunding, which was operations carried out, quantitative tightening actually, uh, uh, to, to, to reduce the quantity of money, they stopped doing that. The rate of money growth accelerated. I criticized and said this is going to lead to inflation. It did. I think um, when one stands back from all this, uh, um, one has to say that uh, Bank of England has not performed very well in this period. One of the odd things about Mr. Pill's speech is he spends a lot of time on quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, asking how it affects the economy. He says it's partly through asset prices. He even says this is quite monetary. You bet it is. You bet it is. That's because that is the way that quantitative tightening, quantitative easing work. They affect the quantity of money that affects the economy. And it's really quite shocking that in this speech, uh, Mr. Pill endorses uh, the Andrew Bailey view that the cause of inflation, uh, the current inflation, is all these external shocks, not the rapid money growth of 2020. What I put to both of them is if you think that quantitative tightening is not relevant to inflation, why are you carrying, out, carrying it out now? You know very well people at the Bank of England, that the effect of quantitative tightening is to reduce the quantity of money and that will affect inflation. Be honest about it. Thank you.